Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about um, integrative reviews and why we do them and the purpose they serve in our field as Elizabeth and I see that. Um, I definitely encourage you to, uh, if you feel like interrupting, just you can raise your hand or whatever. Um, it's much better if it's conversational, but I will continue to blather on. So like I said, if you feel like you're getting confused or you need clarification or you're like, hey, wait a minute, I think that's BS, like then please feel free to stop me and we can discuss. Um, this is again, my view with Elizabeth's and how we think about how this fits within the field. So let's get right to it. So, you know, one of Huff's ideas uh, is, Anne Huff's is, of course, that we are always in engaging in a research conversation. Um, so this is, um, oh, and Andrew just sent me a direct message. Uh, sure, I would take a copy of your notes. Um, but let me just tell the rest of you, it's Ibrat's going to be looking at the chat, but it's going to be tough for me, you know, in my aged years to multitask, right? I'm already got to sort of do this. So definitely, if you need me to answer something, talk it or make Ibrat ask me. Thank you. All right. So anyway, um, we're always joining a research conversation, right? And that is one of sense making and sense giving. So what has been accumulated in our academic publications and in our presentations and in what we teach is kind of what we know. And from that, individual scholars say, well, given what we know, what else do we need to know, right? That's a sense-making function that they then produce research that should go back into the conversation about what do we know about this topic or this model or this particular empirical finding. The integrative review is a, one of the kinds of ways in which we synthesize knowledge, because in order to understand anything, it's not obviously done in one study or even a bunch of studies. It's a whole variety of structures of studies of different kinds with different knowledge that come together to sort of make sense of a very complicated topic, whatever that is. And making sense of that doesn't mean adding complexity. In a way, it means simplifying as much as possible. So... For the scholar who sits in the middle of these feedback loops, right, um, scholars create work, right, which is to give sense to the data that comes up, but then they take the data, which of course constrains what they find, and they try and make sense of what that means. So, you know, again, we create data, and then we make models out of that data that seem to be supported. Similarly, this is sort of the empirical side. It's the, it's the lower part, right? It's the foundation. There are, as we have accumulations of models and data, um, we synthesize these together. We synthesize results to sort of say, well, what really is the relationship between X and Y? That's the meta-analysis function, right? Um, or we do reviews where we say, well, people have studied this topic a lot. You know, how do we put that stuff together? Which again, adds to the knowledge, but the knowledge that is there constrains how we do that synthesis. So once again, the synthesis are giving sense to what we we know, but the knowledge constrains that, right? And helps us, but it helps also organize that via topics. And that's what we're trying to do. I talked about meta-analyses as the sort of like empirical, as an empirical synthesis vehicle. But in fact, when we get up at that higher loop, but we're talking about knowledge, there's really four different ways which we synthesize. Theory, and then sort of three review types that we know. Theory is as the definition is there, right? A statement about relationships among a set of constructs with the accompanying logic and assumptions. A narrative review, whereas the theory says, I think given what evidence we have, this is what is happening. It's speculative, right? Reviews are more looking back and saying, this seems to be established, right? And in the, in the case of the narrative review, it's, well, here's what we've established about this idea in these different spaces, right? So it's the state of knowledge concerning relations of interest that highlight important issues that we still need to study. So what do we know about creativity right now? You know, well, we study it in individuals, we study it in brainstorming, and then we sometimes study it in innovation. And this is what we, what is in that sort of giant sphere that is creativity, that topic. The systematic review emerged out of people who sort of realized that a, um, you know, an, um, <clears throat> A meta-analysis tends to not exist in any actual context, 
right? Uh, the systematic review is if you, was for if you were in a particular situation and you wanted to know, what should I do here? You know, could you look at the evidence and come up with a come up with a diagnosis? And this, of course, comes from medicine, where you would say, okay, um, you know, Matt Cronin, fifty-year-old white male from north the Northeast, comes in complaining of these symptoms. Okay, given who he is and what he does, what do we think is happening? Right. So, what is and oh, there seems to be that he has a you know his shoulders is strained. What do we know about what we should do for that? The integrative review, though, is broader because it sort of says, you know, instead of saying, well, what should we do? It says, what should we know, right? What do we need to know about the state of knowledge? So in that way, it's more like a narrative review. But where it's different is that it actually tries to synthesize and integrate all the different perspectives on a topic, right? So if I, we go back to creativity, People study creativity from a lot of different vantage points, right? Even a lot of different disciplines. So to really understand how that whole elephant is, right? We sort of have to understand not just the components, but how they fit together. And it's not just a matter of making categories. It's a matter of understanding how those categories relate to each other. So that's the integrative review. So what's the per point, right? A theory is to propose new constructs and so that you can study them. Constructs in a relationship so that you can study them, which is a model. The narrative review says, here's what we who are studying this topic a particular way have looked at. What else is there, right? The integrative review, I'm going to jump because I said it's like a narrative review, says, uh, okay, for all of us who are studying creativity, when we look across the different ways that we are studying it and the different ways that we've approached this, what does it say about what we need to do next, right? How do we have to sort of have a change to the way we are thinking about this topic. And that is what I'm going to call redirection, which is different from adjudication, which is what do I do? That's the systematic review. The systematic review is I need to make my employees more creative. They work in these kinds of teams in construction. They're working on large scale projects. What do I need to do? What's going to work? That's a systematic review. So a different way to look at this, this is from uh, an annals by uh, David Nicolini and his colleagues, one I really like, on communities of practice, because, and they sort of show you um, where each of these is, right? So the theory is in one of the bullets, right? Develop, like, how do uh, we use learning? How does learning work in a community of practice to develop competencies? You could have a theory on how that works and that could be then tested. You can also see it in terms of a narrative review, you know, which could be one of these bullets or maybe a couple of them, right? You know, storytelling and understanding in learning communities, right? What do we know? When you get to a the green, that's more the systematic review where if we were to say, okay, if we're thinking about that, do communities of practice protect the expert social position, we could actually look at the research and say, does it do that? right? And these are some of the other aspects that would lend itself to sort of understanding how defending operates and what we can say is true about that and what isn't. But the integrated review looks at all of it together and asks, well, how do these different frameworks, right? These different learning, innovating, and defending frameworks help us understand in advance what a community of practice is and why it's useful as a management concept. Okay, so in thinking about what are we doing, right? Like theory uses papers to um, create uh, the model, right? So actually, let me start with the integrated review because this, this is really what this is about. When we say the integrated review wants to know everything, it says you need to look at pretty much everything, either find directly or sample everything that's been written about a topic, communities of practice, creativity, conflict, whatever, in order to say, this is all that we know, and these are the voices that need to be integrated, right? Which is much bigger than any of these other things, right? Whereas a systematic review has a much more focused question it's trying to answer, right? Integrated review, what do we know? Systematic review, what is true, right? The narrative review is also what we know, but it doesn't need to integrate. It's free to sort of just organize, right? And similarly, so, when it comes to selecting what papers go in, the author has sort of more freedom, right, in the narrative review. 
Uh, the systematic review, the paper selection is more directed. And in theory, the theory is what drives the paper selection, right? So you are saying, this is what I'm trying to say is true and why it works. So let me get papers that support that. When you synthesize them, the integrative review is very much an emergent process, right? So as you're looking at everything that's been said, you're trying to say, okay, what is the what are the themes that emerge collectively when we look at all of it? So uh, you'll hear me say this again, but we always say, you know, when you think about empirical work, theoretical work, and review work, AMJ is empirical work and it makes bricks. AMR is theoretical work; it makes houses. And the annals understands how we the knowledge by looking at neighborhoods in which those houses are contained. From the 30,000 foot view, we can sort of see what there is to be seen. So, whereas a systematic review, right, is looking for evidence for or against, and a narrative review can sort of just say, here's how we build houses in this neighborhood, and here's how we build houses in this neighborhood, if it even bothers to look across neighborhoods, it doesn't really have to sort of make coherent sense of that. All right. Okay, Matt, great. You're giving us the big overview. How do I do it? All right, now we're getting to that. This is the process that we have sort of given to people, right? And again, I, I will defend my uh, giving you the overview because it's really, when we understand why we do something, it makes it easier to understand how what we are doing supports that why. So in the integrated review, we start with the choice of a synthesis vehicle. Then we have to sort of get all that literature that's on the topic and then sort of synthesize those themes. And this, I'm going to walk you through stuff that's pretty much right out of our paper. So I'm not going to read as much. I'm just going to kind of give you the overview of like, you know, my thoughts, like almost like the director's uh, narrative of the of the movie as you're watching it. Um, so, okay. So the first thing is we're going to choose a vehicle and we put this lovely little like flow chart in. And, and the first question is, are you adjudicating or redirecting? Adjudicating means who's right and who's wrong. Like, what is, you know, like, that's the court case. What are we going to judge as to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, as much as we can say that? Redirection is more about how should we think differently? How should we change our perspective, right? Adjudication is right or wrong. Redirection is how we think. And you have to figure out which of those are you doing. So first thing you should figure out is adjudication even possible, right? So again, to give... um to give another example of these, right? Adjudication, what's true and what's false. So what is the average effect of autonomy on team performance, right? That has an answer. What factors change the impact of diversity on task conflict? That is a more complicated answer, but it's also got an answer. Um, uh, what characteristics work best for retention of mid-level managers in high volatility fields? Also has an answer, right? A nuanced answer that requires more weaving, but still an answer. In contrast, we took those three concepts, right? What do we know about autonomy? How should we think differently about autonomy? That's a redirection question. How might diversity limit task conflict? Even though that has an answer, you could still say, maybe it should change the way we think about diversity as it relates to task conflict, or even what task conflict is in the face of diverse opinions, right? Um, how do managers think about turnover when a field has high volatility? That's a redirection question because, again, it's about how do we think about turnover, but it's just in more circumscribed conditions, the, right? So which one are you trying to do? What's your research question? You know, like most things in our field, the right method, and this is what we're talking about, depends on the question you're asking. Okay. So... This is, again, sort of where we talked about adjudication versus redirection, like who is doing what, right? Theories are really more about redirection. So are narrative reviews and integrated reviews. Systematic reviews are adjudication, right? So that's a simple way to sort of get rid of that one if you were going to go in that direction. And by the way, adjudication is important, right? Like our field suffers from a very overgrown garden, right? Because nobody has weeded the things that are no longer useful, you know, to use that analogy. Um, so if adjudication is possible, it's a good thing to do, right? But that requires that you have an intellective question, one that can be meaningfully answered with uh, that in, in a right and wrong kind of way. And there's enough studies, right, that you can actually say, here is what is true and here is what is not. Um, you know, there's, we also have an issue in our, in our field of like understanding, like, 
context. Um, many of people have heard me say we're sometimes like biologists who don't pay attention to species, where we sort of assume that one function sort of is true of all the different organizational forms. That's a that's an ongoing thing. So I just wanted to mention it. But again, of course, the question is, can we say this is what this is how X affects Y, right? In a way that is verifiable. And even better, if we're doing something like a systematic review, can we say X is a better thing to do to, to get Y than Z or B or A, right? Which is comparison. Adjudication is not possible when studies don't have commensurate. Uh, concepts or phenomena, or the the methods are epistemically incompatible, right? You have some people doing qualitative work, you have some people doing quantitative work, and the two don't ever try and reconcile with each other, right? So if adjudication is possible, right, you're really looking at meta-analysis or a systematic review. And if you're lucky enough to have the same kinds of data Right in this, with the same kinds of constructs in similar kinds of concept contexts, then a meta analysis can be useful. Right. If, however, you want to know about a particular context, right? You want to know about a, you know, again, hospitals, hospital emergency rooms, or universities, or you don't have numerical data in sufficient quantity, then you should go with a systematic review. All right. But if not, we want redirection. Now. It's really important to say that redirection is always possible, but often not necessary. And in our field, which is ridiculously uh, overenthusiastic about um, novelty, we should not redirect unless we have to, honestly. Um, and so that means maybe research is stalled on a topic, right? We seem to be covering the same ground again and again, right? Task conflict still isn't helpful, despite all the ways we try and see if it can be, right? Maybe there's some kind of systematic deviation, right, that between what we find in our expectations, right? So, you know, all of the great work on brainstorming never actually seems to do much in terms of the actual products or has a very low sort of relationship to it. There's some kind of problem there. Or maybe a researcher describing different parts of the elephant, right? Maybe um, these people are looking at respect and these people are looking at trust and they seem more similar than they are, but, but we don't know how to reconcile them because they use different languages. If that is the case, then redirection is good because it says, what are we going to do to kind of get over this hump, right? It's kind of like a qualitative difference, but it's inappropriate when a topic lacks convergence, right? So if all of a sudden somebody says, I should do something on allyship, Allyship's important. I'm not sure we know enough about it yet, right? In terms of what the construct is or how it works or what it affects, right? Like it's it's new, right? It, it's going to take some time. There are concepts that we've been studying for decades, but again, they've just never really gotten enough traction for us to really be able to say um, what that they're what what the core is, right? Redirection is about changing your perspective, but if there is no coherent perspective, you can't redirect. All right, but if you can. First thing you should ask is, do you have direct evidence for your belief about what needs to change, right? So what's direct evidence? Because if you don't, if you have direct evidence, then you can go on a review. But if you don't, it's probably going to be a theory. So direct evidence is when no inferences are required, right? This is a legal term, right? I'm standing over a dead body with a smoking gun. That's direct evidence. You don't have to make any inferences to know what the hell happened there, right? Um, circumstantial evidence in contrast, if I'm running away from a dead body, I could have been the victim. I mean, sorry, I could have been the perpetrator or I could be trying to escape the perpetrator, right? You need another inference before you can make sense of that situation. So what does this look like in our world, right? Direct influence is that Jones found X leads to Y and Smith found Y leads to X, right? Both of those things are true. And so that means without making any other inferences, they're in a feedback loop because they can influence each other. That's different from if we said X leads to Y and Smith found that Z leads to Y. And so then to sort of make the inference that X and Z are substitutable or share variants or a million of other things, right? Man, we don't know that yet, right? You might have a theory, it might seem reasonable, um, it's a thing that might be worth exploring, but we don't know, right? So if you don't have direct evidence, you really can't review. 
and say things that are credible, but you can't make theories, right? All right, but let's say you do have direct evidence. Now here's the question. Are you trying to bridge multiple communities of practice or are you just trying to bridge one community of practice? Okay, so we talked about this before. And what it really is, is a group of people who are sort of informally bound together by shared expertise and a passion for a joint enterprise who interact regularly to learn and improve their practice. Think about what you study right now. Think about the other people who study it, who you cite and who cite you, who you talk to at conferences, whose papers you read. That's a community of practice. Odds are you have a common language for talking about things. You have a common way of studying things. And you share a common sort of meta-theoretical framework about what counts as legitimate evidence and what the assumptions you should make about your phenomena are. So what do I mean by that? Like common language. The people who study cognition via mindfulness have a way of talking about how we think that is not the same as the way that people who study information processing, which are the sort of hardcore cognitive psychologists think. They are some ways compatible, some ways incompatible, but it's hard to reconcile them because again, they're both sort of closed systems that each have their own way of talking and thinking. But again, they're focused on the same thing, which is how do we think about stuff and how do we think deeply about stuff? So there should be, there would be usefulness to sort of bringing them together and integrating what they found. Similarly, common, there are common methodological uh, approaches that people have in communities of practice that we would need to integrate. So I say conflict as, and versus identity conflict. And though both are conflicts, and people who do conflict management study identity conflicts, and the people who study identity think about how those are in conflict, they have very different approaches to understanding their phenomena. Right, The people who are in conflict management are mostly using experimental social psychology approaches, looking at lab data using various sort of like, you know, vignettes and things that are sort of narrow and focused. The people who study identity, they are usually doing more qualitative work, having much richer analysis, much deeper, but also much more ideographic analyses. So both of them say something but they're hard to sort of reconcile, right? You don't use one to evaluate the other. You don't say, well, my experiment says that you're wrong, nor would you say, well, my story invalidates your experiment, right? So the last one is we could talk about paradigm schools of thought or meta theories, right? So this is sort of very big, um, but sometimes even they're right next to each other. So TMS stands for transactive memory system. It means that when people who are in a group, everybody sort of specializes and coordinates what they remember and they diverge. The people who study SMM is shared mental model. It says that when people are in a group together and they're trying to understand things, they try and converge so that they know the same things. These people are right next to each other, talking about the same phenomena. But the divergence factor, right, and the convergence factor is a very different representation of what it means to share something in a group, right? And, and that, goes, that goes very deep because the people who think that a group factor is shared say that we should all be sort of looking at agreement statistics to understand what is truly a group level phenomena, whereas that is not possible with transactive memory, where there is a compilational structure where people are different. And we have to say, okay, no, we have to understand how these people are specialized and fit together. That is two fundamentally different things. But again, when uh, Ramon Rico and Susan Mohammed and um, their other colleague, uh, whose name is I'm escaping, forgetting it a second, when they put their sort of teamwork, uh, their, they did their work on cognition and teams for the annals, they really found a wonderful way to sort of bring those things together. All right, so are you attempting to bridge multiple ones? If you are, integrative review is great. If you're not, then a narrative review is, is fine, right? And again, I'm not saying one is better than the other right? Like an integrative review says we are all studying different parts of the elephants and things are starting to get messed up. So we should do something. A narrative review says, hey, we're studying the trunk of the elephant and here's what we know about it, right? So it's fine. Okay. So once we've decided on an integrative review, there's a couple of ways to sort of gather the literature. And this is challenging because you're trying to get everything, right? First thing is you need to articulate the topic locally. What do you mean locally? I mean, Writing an integrated review is difficult. 
and because it has such a broad view. So it means you really have to have a deep understanding of the phenomena. The best way I can sort of give an analogy is think about what you thought our job was like when you started and now what you know our job is like having done it for a while, right? They're different. And so when you get new people who come into the field, they have ideas about how the job is and you go, ah, I, I got to give you some wisdom on this. That's the thing you're trying to leverage when you write an integrated review. So if you start with the topic that you know and hopefully know well, it allows you to sort of really understand what we take for granted as given, as established in that topic, right? So again, if it were me and I was studying creativity, which I do, I could tell you pretty clearly how creativity is studied and what is what the way it's the ways those things are studied and the findings we have, I'm pretty clear about what that is. Now, does this mean I understand how creativity is used in people who do like strategy work on innovation? Not really. You know, do I know how it works in design thinking? A little, right? To get there, I got to start here, right? Start here and sort of say, what is it? What do we understand? And by the way, when you're looking across your journals, you have to look across all of them to try and capture what's been published, and especially across non-A journals. This is actually something we've talked about a lot in our in our group, the Annals, because the fact is, and I got to credit Denise Rousseau for really uh, trumpeting this, the quality in terms of the actual article, as opposed to the sort of like citation count is, you know, the citation count may widely vary, the quality of the article does not. So you do not want to miss things that are in niche journals and small journals and C journals and things, even in chapters that may be very influential. In fact, that's where a lot of very influential things start because they're strange. And it's, so it's important to capture them. So what you want to do, though, is use that to say, OK, well, what are the, you know, what are the concepts that are from within my community that I can use? And then how do I take those concepts and say, what are the synonyms for them that other people use? Right. So, again, if I was using attention to go back to the mindfulness versus information processing, if I were to use attention, right, I might think, how else is attention? What is that called? Right. If I'm thinking. um, uh, algorithm, what else is that called? If I'm, you know, it's also called routines, right? Most things have synonyms in the other communities of practice, and you have to sort of map what those are, right? It's really about finding an, um, what those, like, um, what the similar concepts are and what's been published on them. What you're doing is essentially learning the different languages of the different communities of practice in order to find what is known and what each one has to say, right? Um, there are um, software and things to help with that. And in fact, there's even more every day. There's one called Jane, and I forget what that stands for, but it basically you put in an abstract and it searches all these other journals that might sort of talk about the same thing. It's pretty remarkable. But, um, but the point is here is that you really want to know what all the different communities have to say about the topic, which means you understand what their research is, given the models that they are testing and advocating. Once you do that, you want to sort of say, what are the voices? Each community of practice is a voice. So to give a simple example, recently, they, um, Sarah Harvey and her colleagues, um, Eric Reichel and um, uh, um, Mel, um, God, I am so terrible with names. I should just stop. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a recent analyst paper on wave versus particle duality in um, in uh, creativity. Particle says ideas are discrete. Wave says ideas are parts of sort of multiple sets of ideas that sort of evolve and change together, right? They were different ways of thinking about things. Each was a voice, right? Each had a voice that it wanted to sort of contribute to. How do we understand the way ideas evolve and change? And they wanted to keep those things separate because even though there was way, way more evidence and way more work on the on the particle view, most people treat ideas as discrete. That did not invalidate at all what was done in the wave view. And you needed to make sure that that voice was heard. 
So you want to make sure you have all the voices, right? All the different parts of the, that are speaking to all the different parts of the elephant. And then you want to distill those things into what are the most important points of view that emerge from this set of communities. Now, sometimes there's a lot of voices. Sometimes there's a lot of research. Believe it or not, some people, uh, Sharon Parker and uh, Joe Capini and uh, uh, Griffin, um, they synthesized, I want to say, close to 10,000 studies on productivity. Pretty insane. They used a bibliometric analysis, right? But in all cases, no matter how big the data, right? We're trying to say, but what are the themes that are really important? Jane, thank you. I just saw that. Um, journal author name estimator. Um, anyway, so you you want to use whatever method you can to sort of like anything, take make a very complicated situation as simple as possible, but no simpler. So you try and find what's unique, what's different, what's shared, what's not, and put them together in a way that sort of says, given everything, all the voices, here is what we know, right? It's really important, though, that you don't use one community to evaluate another, right? So if you are somebody who is, like I said, if, if there's 100 studies on uh, status conflict in the lab, right, and they don't comport with the three studies that were done qualitatively in the field, right, you really want to recognize that that distinction is meaningful, right? They found something about the mechanism in the lab. They found something else in the field. So there's probably a reason for that. What is that? This is, the, this is where the value of the integrated review is because when we sort of look at that high level and we don't try and sort of adjudicate who is right and who is wrong, we can begin to think and imagine how these things might fit together in a more productive way. Okay, so... We want to sort of try and understand when we see divergence, you know, sometimes it's like these people are looking at this and these people are looking at that. But when we see divergence, we want to sort of understand, well, why is that the case, right? So at the end of this, hopefully you have a giant database of what we know, right? Like you have a topic of review and you have different communities of practice who study that topic. And some of those things overlap and some don't, some conflict and some don't. But at the end of the day, you, you can say, this is what we know pretty well, because again, we are looking for direct evidence, direct evidence that you can point to and say, these people showed this is true, right? These people showed that is true. That is the basis from which you have to make your integration. And as an aside, simpler will be much easier. So you always want to try and sort of distill things down to the essence of what is important. And that's when we get to the thematic synthesis. Um, so from these themes, how can you put them together into a sensible framework? A framework is, again, a model that tells you a process of how something works, right? Like how conflict is managed, um, a structure that separates things that influence each other. So how does sort of cognitive diversity emerge out of demographic diversity and how do these things influence each other in the in the face of power relations, right? Something that sort of configures things together for what we know. And it's actually not unlike doing this, you know, in qualitative work, right? Qualitative work has a similar thing, right? Where you sort of look for themes and then you look for higher level themes. You should think of that as almost an analogous process. It's just that instead of the data being your the people you're talking to, um, the data um, have, sorry, I just, I just, uh, Sumit just asked a, a really good question and it caught my eye. And so totally threw me off. So I'm going to forget what I was just saying. And I want to answer that question. Can one study have more than one framework? So as a, an integrative review has to have an integration of frameworks. When you are in a study, who knows, right? They might use different theoretical frameworks to support a model. They might try and bridge those frameworks. It might be nebulous. I don't know. But what you're trying to come up with for a, it's a really good question, right? What you're trying to come up with is an integration. The integration is always the hardest part because we are so used to talking about what's in the box, not how the boxes relate to each other. 
what's in the cell, not how the dimensions of the table relate to each other, right? So that is what we're, I, what is the sort of shift, right? It's not about what is in a cell, it's about how that relates to the rest of what is out there. So you have to start out by saying, well, what, what is in the cell, right? What are those themes? And then you have to start by thinking, how do they relate to each other, right? How do those themes actually, you know, um, you know, what does the work so there was a, a paper uh, by Emma Zhao and her colleagues on leaders and how they deal with conflict in groups, right? So they were looking at how do we think about conflict in groups, how do leaders manage groups, and trying to map them together to say, okay, well, you know, how do leaders deal with the conflict, right? Especially when they may actually benefit from it or they may use it instrumentally, right? These are the themes that emerge to sort of try and say, okay, well, how can we blend these things together, which again, sort of took thing, thinking about what is the leader's function? What is conflict's function? What might the leader want conflict to do? What conflict might do to the, what might conflict do to the leader, right? And they kind of came up with a, a framework for how leaders got, you know, chose to get involved, got sucked in, whether they used it for instrumental purposes or not. Again, it emerged, but you had to weave it together so that at the end of the day, it was a process model of how leaders were, were sort of reacting to the conflict that was emergent in their groups. A coherent whole is your friend, right? Some models are very complicated, right? But at the end of the day, if you can tell a, a, a good coherent story, it can, it can be complicated as long as it all sort of makes sense together. I think of this as the Game of Thrones problem, right? Game of Thrones is a really complicated show, right? Where people are dying and all kinds of stuff's coming happening and there's all sorts of different places going on, right? But there's a sort of general theme, right? That sort of binds it all together. There's a general sort of purpose about, you know, there's a story arc where you can sort of see how everything kind of fits together with it. And this is, of course, just human memory and chunking, right? We can understand it if it fits together and the more, co more coherent it is, the more we can remember and the more we can understand. Tables and figures are really the great way to do that, right? They sort of draw your attention. But again, it's figures are almost better than tables because with a table, you want to look at the cells. With a figure, sometimes you can see the whole thing, right? And getting people to see the whole picture is important. That also takes time. Right. So um, you want to minimize this as much as possible and you want to get other people's views on how to do that. Right. Using other people. I mean, it's nice. One of the nice things about the annals, if, if that was the place you chose to put your work, is that, you know, our associate editors work very closely with people to help them develop models. So that sort of seem like they capture the essence of what the authors wanted, but they're communicative. So. I'm going to show you one that's complicated, but you can get, right? This is this this next one is from uh, Clow et al., right? And they were sort of looking at how people, uh, entrepreneurs, were gathering capital, right? And even though there's a ton of arrows here, right, it's if you're reading the paper, what they're saying is the size of the arrow tells you about how much people study one thing affecting another thing, right? So there's a little bit of work on social capital as it affects human capital. There's a ton of work on how social capital affects financial capital, right? They also have feedback, right? There's a ton of work on how social capital affects other social capital. There is not so much on how human capital builds or affects other human capital, right? So this is, the, the object here is for you to understand that not the sort of anything in particular, right, about the arrows, but rather to look at overall and say, when we look at the way entrepreneurs uh, gather capital, there's four types. They influence each other, but the way they influence each other is lopsided in how much we understand about it. So from this, we know we certainly would have to think a lot more about, you know, the, the biggest need is here, right? How financial capital actually helps give you other capital. Maybe we can stop with how human capital or social capital or other capital leads to financial capital, right? A lot of work on that. 
So this is something, and again, this is something we sort of worked through and it took a little bit of time to do. All right. I'm going to, um, it's funny, Ibrad said I should stop every once in a while, and I told him I might not because I have bad habits, and so I have proven myself correct. Um, so let me stop here. I want to I want to abstract out, back out for just a second, but first let me stop and say, do you have any, are there any sort of like pressing questions before I, I have a couple more things I want to say just about how the annals in particular, because now that of course, you know, Elizabeth and I are editing it, we have we have a view on that that might be helpful if you wanted to publish there. Uh, All right. I've got a question. Go ahead. Um, what is if you have a too broad topic to cover all what was ever written about it? So you know there is some confusion going on in the topic and there is a need to, for an integrative review, but you know you can't read everything because it's in about nine million or something. Yeah, well actually, so so we're actually working on this right now, um, this problem, because what do you do when like, the annals usually looks for about 200, 250 articles, but what do you do when there's a thousand? That's too much, right? And I think we should be able to sample, right? I think we do that with data. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, uh, why couldn't we do that with sort of studies, right? If you sample enough, you know, assuming you had 20 studies on the same thing, you would hope that uh, what you would get would be a pretty clear view of what is there. So, so. We don't actually, we're, again, we're building those things, but if I were you and I were writing something and I would make an argument, right, for why your sampling method or why or how you were going to leverage other reviews, right? In all cases, we're looking for an argument for why these data have bearing on what you're saying. All method is that. All method is this is a reasonable way to make inferences. Um, someone asked, what do we look for in a five-page proposal? Well, let me tell you. Um, first, let me tell you that these are the academy journals. This is Discovery, Journal, Review, and the Annals. And something I'd written with uh, Jeroen Stoughton and Dan, Don Van Nippenberg, we were talking about programmatic theory, which is what do we know about a topic? This is a stock and flow model. And we sort of believe that this is what we are trying to build in our in our field, right? We are trying to say, what do we know for sure about a topic? For sure, if we know it for sure, we can tell a manager, do this and it will work. That's what we need, right? We need credible, useful, effective science. But it requires putting all this stuff together, right? It requires that somebody discover something and then sort of tests out a whole bunch of hypotheses to see how does it actually work? And then to synthesize the, the hypotheses that are true into a small theory, right? A unit theory that, you know, says this is how this works at a particular, um, you know, in a particular situation. And then when we talk about all the particular situations that are topically related, i.e. conflict, right? That's programmatic theory. So programmatic theory on conflict is benefited by supported unit theories on task conflict, relationship conflict, status conflict, values conflict, right? And those things, when they're coherent in a coherent framework, right, make a good programmatic theory. This is really important because when you think about the journals this way, and, and really there also are activities, right? Discovering new things, empirical tests, theories that make sense of lots of empirical tests, and then programmatic theories or re integrated reviews that make sense of bodies of research, that is what we should be teaching to people and telling to policymakers, because that is what we do. And this also means that a lot of what we're writing is for us, but we all this stuff has to work together for it to sort of be workable for managers. That's a bigger picture reason of why I'm sort of um, sort of trying to like get all of our journals to be aligned. So it also underlies what we ask for when we want you to publish up in annals, because we want to sort of say, you are taking all the good stuff from the other empirical and theoretical journals and synthesizing it together and something we can have confidence in as being true. So let me just say, what do we ask for in the proposal? Now I'm sort of shifting to annals in particular, because um, um, 
who asked me that question? Sumit. So first is, what are you covering? What else is, that's the focus, right? What are you covering? What else has been done? How are you actually going to uh, do the review, like gather the this, this studies and what is going to come, what new insights are you going to have, right? So let me go into those each a little bit, right? Generally speaking, here's some things that stand out, like a topic that is fresh and not reviewed, not too narrow, right? Like we've had a million voice reviews. We don't need any more of those. We've had a lot of diversity reviews. We don't need any more of those. Not to say you couldn't take a different angle on these things, but it's unlikely, right? It's narrower and narrower. Um, you know, some things need refreshing, right? It's been a long time since there was a creativity review. So there was another one that came out recently, but the topic needs to be big enough so that, you know, it seems substantial and you would give it to, uh, you know, if you said you're going to go into the management field, you would say, this is something you need to know about. Um, you have to be clear about how you're getting this article. So this goes back to Julia's question, what if there are too many? And actually, I heard another person, I just sort of saw another one that said, you know, what if there's, you know, what if the evidence is too small, around 100 articles, right? Well, you may not have enough, right? You may, the, the, it may not be ready for an integrated review because the topic needs to be big enough. Um, and you need to be able to sort of justify that, right? And similarly, like, why are we doing this review? right? There has to be a justifiable impact. And what's really important here is that impact has to be, this is where the direct evidence thing comes in. It has to be something you can demonstrate. It has to be something where you can point to studies that say this shows this topic affects organizations, organizationally consequential dependent variables. Shows it. Not I think it will. It shows it. That's really important. So let me, let me, let me dig into this a little bit more, right? The first thing we said is it's, you know, is it review worthy, right? And this is really more about breadth of research than what, you know, you think is important, right? Um, now, listen, we always have things that we think are important that others don't, right? But So how do you sort of combat that? You sort of say a lot of people are studying this, right? That's why nothing says that a, a topic is more important than a whole lot of people studying it, right? That's a pretty good indicator. Um, Sometimes it may be an important thing, right? First offer, first, first offers in negotiation. That was a topic we got once. It's important, just too narrow for, for an integrated review. You could do that in a meta-analysis. You could do that in a narrative review. And again, sometimes things are too new. So the person who asked me about, what if there's only 100 articles? My guess might be too new, right? Um, if there has not been a recent review, because we ask you to say, what are the other reviews on this? Sometimes people say, oh, there hasn't been. There's been one on, you know, you know, there's been one on voice, but not voice in the way that I'm talking about it. Got to be careful there, because um, I always like to say to the metalhead, death metal, doom metal and death doom metal are all identifiably different. But to most people, it's all slow growling. Right. So you are likely to be the metalhead talking about the distinctions. The annals is meant to be broadly read. And so it's much better if you can say anyone could see why these things are distinct. Right. This review is distinct from others. And um, so, again, Ph.D. seminar test is a good one. You know, if you were teaching a Ph.D. seminar and you would you give this paper up this review to them because you'd say, I feel like you need to know this if you're going to be in our field more your answer is yes, the better the better a criteria that is. All right. Um, again, when you're talking about how do you make the literature, making it clear how the literature has been viewed, you have to demonstrate that you've gathered all the relevant perspectives, right? And again, um, you need to sort of, if there's too many, you need to sort of say, I've made a good faith effort to sort of capture what each community of practice said. That's the, if there are too many studies, right? Like, uh, but if there's around, I would say two to 500, you better get all of them. That may sound daunting, but again, it's why we think analyst papers are big. It's why you don't have a ton of, it's why I'm, Elizabeth will say most people have one or two of them in them across their career. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very big thing. Um, 
Nathan, what you you've got your you what, what what what's up? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, this is uh, I guess a little personal, and you and you know where this is probably coming from, but I'm interested in like after a proposal has been accepted, or we get to this stage of saying, I've identified a literature, I feel confident that it meets these criteria. When people are trying to write their integrative reviews, what do you see as some of the biggest mistakes they make in translating this idea of integration and redirection into an actual manuscript that does those things? So when you're reviewing, I'm get, basically what I'm asking is, yeah. What could authors do more effectively to make this all actually happen? Well, one of the things that's lucky is um, what a lot of people still don't realize about the annals is our process is that you submit the five page proposal. It gets blind reviewed by two people. Usually you have to do a resubmission. But once we say, hey, this is good, we're going to like so like when I was in AE, if they said, hey, Nathan, your proposal is great. We're going to assign you to Matt. You and I are going to work together closely. Right. So. I'm not just going to say you're going to not going to put in something and I'm going to say, I don't like it. It goes right. I mean, honestly, I at that point, I want you to get this out. I'm like, but I'm like a music producer. Right. Um, you know, it's your song. I'm trying to get your song to, to be radio friendly, you know, and and a hit like and I want it to be the hit you want it to be. But maybe that you can't get it there by yourself. So so it's more collaborative, way more collaborative. Right. And it's more hands on. It's more personal. Now, do authors still make mistakes? Yes. What are they? The laundry list. Always a mistake. Here are the five billion findings I have. And now let me tell you in excruciating detail all the things that have been said uh, about, you know, this subset of this topic. Right. In this part of the model, here's the 50,000 things. We, OK, no. Right. Synthesize, synthesize, synthesize. After people synthesize integration. That's the hardest part, right? Integration is, okay, we've synthesized all the little nuggets, but what do they mean as a collection, right? How do them, how does thinking about them together advance our thinking on the topic, right? Seeing the arrows, not the boxes, right? And not just the arrows, the structure of the arrows, right? The other thing, um, the difference between a theory and a, uh, um, a theory and a review. So it's a gray area, right? So people have to sort of look at what's been found and put those things together, but they can't speculate. If you ever find yourself saying, well, people found X leads to Y and you know Z leads to Y and A leads to Y and B leads to Y, and all those things are related to C, I think C leads to Y. Nope, your theory, right? Like, unless you can point to it, it's theory. So how do we get insight with just using what's already there? Again, patterns that emerge when you go higher up, which is why the integrative part is so difficult. Now, luckily, your AE will help you with that, right? And again, my own view of the field is peer review would work better in general that way, right? Because we all sort of do this and we all sort of know how to train others. And sort of, that, so that's why we should sort of be trying to do that. Um, but it, again, I think the main thing is the hard, the hardest hurdle, I think, is in articulating the what is the um, if I've looked across all of this literature, what is the insight? Um, and that one, actually, the, the common mistake is to say. Construct clarity is bad and there's a lot of constructs that mean the same thing and the field's a mess or this 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 part of you know this area of research is a mess and I say yes as is every other area of research in our field right that's the equivalent of the AMJ you know no one studied this before it's like yeah that's not a motivation to study it right the field's a mess that's not a motivation right you got to say something specific not just that conflict is um studied in a static way but here's why if we don't study it in a dynamic way we're going to get it wrong right so the the insight has to be specific and it has to be the punchline of the review so does that answer your question yeah i think it's it's really helpful i'm i'm sure i'll have more questions in the future sure. but i okay. appreciate the uh, response 
All right, so getting back to sort of how the literature is going to be reviewed again, because that is your data, right? Uh, beyond that, sometimes it used to be that you could write an annals paper and say, you know, hey, this seems like it's interesting. Trust me, I'll find something. Not anymore, right? You need to like you need to have a good idea, almost like have the paper in mind, right? Maybe even written in a draft form before you submit. I know that's a high bar, but I mean, again, like we always ask people to do a lot of work. It is a lot of work. It is a heavy lift. It's most people enjoy it because again, it's collaborative, but it's a heavy lift. So in order to do that in a timely fashion, there really does need to be a pretty good pre pre work done and you need to sort of know what you're getting into. All right. This is what I was saying about the value add, right? What have we learned about the central problem or question? Right? What does this collection of knowledge, when we take that 30,000 foot view, what can we say needs to happen? Right? Um, it's important to think about what questions are not being asked. Right? A narrative review is just, here's what we have. The integrated review is, here's what we also need. Right? Um, and then are there systematic like features of the way work is being done? that might affect how future research is be getting carried out. So there's, a, you know, um, Jang, Elfenbein, and Bottom uh, did this great work on conflict. And that's, by the way, that's also my other home discipline, which is why I know those things in particular, um, where they said, you know, uh, conflicts in experimental monoculture, everybody's doing social psychology research, but when we re read books that practitioners use, books don't think about it that way at all. Those things aren't working together. We got to put them together, right? That is a methodological feature and a cultural one, right? It was like an experimental monoculture. That's their word, right? Like that sort of is preventing the research from advancing to the next level, right? Really critical, really critical point, right? And of course, you know, what you're really doing with an integrative review is redirecting research on that topic, right? So what is it that you want specifically, what is it you want people to do differently when they're doing research next, right? Doing research, it's the, the highest level, right? A theory is, you know, like empirics say, this is true. Theory says, this is what I think might be happening. Let's see if it is. We're saying, how do we sort of think about this topic differently? So like I said, yeah, we these are some common things that are not good, right? We reconcile conflicting definitions. We provide suggestions for managers. So by the way, we reconcile conflicting definitions. That's adjudication. That's not what we're doing, right? Especially since you're trying to integrate different voices, which may not be, which may ultimately be sort of incompatible, right? You can align them, but you can't necessarily reconcile them. We're not doing a giant creation of a mean, right? When we say we provide suggestions for managers, that's not what this is for. This is for researchers. Now, we may take an analyst paper and give it to managers so that they can read it and think about it, or even policymakers. So there's a great one that just came out by Peter Capelli and Elder Liat on contracting light, right? How is it that um, organizations are now sort of changing the employment relationship and almost making it more like a contracting relationship? And even having contractors intermingle with employees, which is causing all kinds of problems. It was a beautiful piece of work that is kind of like an, oh my God, wake up call for the gig economy, among other things. That's absolutely readable by a policymaker, right? It's absolutely readable by an HR professional. But is it saying, here's what you should do? No, it's not, right? It's giving them a framework to think about what they should do, which is very useful. Like I said, we're not determining who is right, and you're not offering a new framework. Now, I realize this is a little confusing, right? When I say a new framework, what I mean is you're not proposing a theory, right? Your framework comes from what you found, it comes from your organization of what you found. I can't say this enough. It's always a difficult, it's always difficult to sort of like see that, that back and forth, right? But again, a review is a review of what we know. And that's often what, uh, you know, what it causes problems. The other thing is, like I said, um, sometimes people like, like I said, they look at the cells, they look at the, the sort of the, the pieces rather than the overall structure and say that's what the value is. And sometimes, you know, um, 
if an integrated review has only one perspective and there are others, right? So negotiation, if you did a negotiation review and you only use the social psychological perspective, that would undermine the value. If you use the, the, the teams one I told you about earlier, right? The people who study teams and shared mental model and transacted memory are not the only people who think about collective thought, right? So that also was not enough, right? The value of an integration comes from the different voices. Um, I feel like a broken record, but you know it's what I wind up saying. All right, and then the last thing is like it's written in a clear, competent, and generally accessible way. Obviously, right? That's fairly self-explanatory. The only thing I would say about that is because the annals, and I think integrated review should be this way in general, right? Because they are, um, uh, they are trying to talk to a broad audience and lump. They're trying to bring people together. Anyone should be able to read it. So all of the other scholars should be able to read it, policymakers should be able to read it, and teachers should be able to read it in order to tell students, you know, here's what this means. Um, managers probably should be able to read it, but it's not a huge deal if they can't. Um, you know, sometimes what we do is specialized, right? You you have to know a lot about a topic sort of typically to, to parse things, but that's maybe a separate conversation. Um, all right. So I've gone on for my, a little bit over my hour, which is uh, five minutes more than I wanted to. So, so there's a lot of questions. Um, you brought, have you been sort of checking this out? What should I, should I just go through the questions? What do you think? Um, I think you covered a lot of the questions, Matthew. Okay. There's a question just Jane posted from just a moment ago, if you want to respond to that. Mm. Uh, so whether how other types of lit reviews relate to different AOM journals, that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, and the person who just raised their hand, you put your hand back up. I'll, I'll call on you next. Um, so, so a lot of people are doing, uh, like I said, integrative reviews, but whether they're actually integrative reviews, I don't know. They're sort of like, again, I have a particular perspective. JAP does integrative reviews, but I think like uh, that's journal of applied psychology. But um, to me, they seem more like narrative reviews. I think like most things in our field, um, the there's a lot of variation, right, in what people believe. I think um, you know, I would say, you know, for sure with the analyst journals, right, an integrative review goes to us, a theory goes to AMR, empirical uh, hypothesis testing empirical work goes to AMJ, and, you know, uh, non-hypothesis testing empirical work goes to AMD. Um, uh, org science, uh, ASQ, they're all kind of getting into the, into the, into the same business. I personally think, again, science is not a zero-sum game. We, it's kind of absurd that all the journals are competing with each other. Um, this is my own view, right? Like, it's much better if we sort of understand that we're either testing something new, putting things together in a conceptual way that needs to be tested, or saying, here's what we know, right? And so whichever one you're doing, you know, like that that's part of how science accumulates. Um, JOM uh, does, you know, reviews. JOB has the annual conceptual review. Again, it's like I've tried to submit there and gotten bizarre things again, but this, again, that's par for all of our course. So it's my, uh, my unsatisfying answer to your question is for sure, Annals takes integrated reviews and the other academy journals do not. Outside of that, there's a lot of variance. But I think in all cases, if you write a paper that conveys an argument in a good way, that's then then you're on the right foot and, and the rest can work itself out. All right, Chica. Hopefully I have Hi, thank you for sharing your insights. I'm a doctoral student and um, I was, uh, I'm actually working on this paper and I presented in the AOM conference this year. Oh, sorry, 2021. Mm -hmm. But recently, uh, I saw in 2022, uh, a couple of months back, on a similar topic, a uh, review was published. Does that make my work redundant? Or uh, is there any other way in which I can use uh, the write-up or the paper that I've already written? Um, 
So say that again. You, 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 what do you have right now? Uh, so I was working on this paper. I am working on this paper. I presented it in the AOM conference 2021. But uh, recently in 2022, a paper on the similar topic was uh, published mm. in a journal. So does that make my work redundant or uh, is there any other way in which? Well, I'm going to tell you two things, actually. First is... Um... Everything's been said before and everything else can be said better. So there's almost there's often another angle that one can take on something. Um, so no, not not it doesn't automatically make it redundant. But again, if you're a doctoral student, like a review of this magnitude tends to take um a wisdom that comes from experience in the field. So I hopefully you are working with somebody who has that. We obviously have a ton of things that come out with doctoral student first author, first authors, some of which have won awards. Right, the attractiveness advantage uh, by Kelly Nault, I'm thinking of as one of them. But like I said, like to to have the perspective, you I, I would definitely advise you to make sure you have somebody counseling you, uh, or or hopefully even working with you on that. Um, wanted to also uh, sort of give a shout out to Lillian. Say JAP has conceptual records, but it's not narrative review, and there's info on it. Um, you know, I, I don't know, Lillian, if there there's a thing going around where all the ed journal editors are trying to sort of come together and, and sort of like coordinate ourselves and give each other sort of support. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if JAP is on it, but if it if it's not and you're not sure what I'm talking about and you're interested, please reach out to me because I really think editorial work, we, we could be more organized and helpful to each other. So thank you for that. Um, all right. Uh, Julia? Um, I had another question. You said that um, the integrated review is about patterns that emerge when you go higher up. Mm -hmm. And now is my question. So if you see this pattern and you can make some sense of it, then don't you actually offer a new framework? Well, again, I think that's a fair thing. The, the main, my main, uh, you know, I, I might now that I might revise that bullet point, honestly, like I can see why you would say that my what I really wanted to just get people to do there is say it's not theoretical. Mm -hmm. Your framework is the punchline of the review. So it is new. So I think I think you're right. That's probably a that's that's a whole that that bullet point should be revised and removed. So thanks for that clarification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So Todd asked, does annals take narrative reviews? Nope, we do not. Um. Simple enough. Right. Um. Uh, Devin asked, uh, does it make sense to draw boundaries between different communities of practice by theoretical perspective? For instance, if you're trying to integrate literature on a phenomenon, like experimentation, testing, business ideas, it makes sense to categorize literature by theory and then try to integrate the themes across papers using different theories. I'm not sure, because I, I can't tell from that alone, right? But I do think for, sh but the point is like, when we think about a community of practice, it's a voice, right? It's a voice in a choir that you're trying to harmonize with the other voices. So it has to continue to persist. It may not be, it may be quieter. It may be a different note, right? But you're trying to harmonize it. And there's a lot of different ways you could think about doing that, right? And theory is one of them, as empirical method is another, as is fine, as groups of findings, right? So, so plausibly, I think you could do that, yeah. Um, he went said if phenomena has been studied uh, by dis disciplines and there's an in wait phenomena concept has been studied by different disciplines and therefore an integrated framework is either difficult to derive or meaningless what should we do uh, because I would assume that when we do an integrated review we always want to have a certain audience in mind ah uh, we want a broad audience right the audience is the people who are concerned about the topic right so take any topic um let's say selection okay Maybe there's a lot of work on selection, obviously, right? Maybe there is something that you can't reconcile. Well, then that means don't write the review, right? Um, but we, but for sure, we are not looking for a particular audience, right? We are trying to have a general audience. What we want in management winds up splitting a lot. We split, we split, we split, right? We need to sort of integrate and come back together and lump. So I think that's the way I, I think about that question. Okay, Mark. 
Yeah. Hey, thanks, Matt, for doing this. Um, qu real quick question, just really about maybe definitions. Ann Huff's got a book yep. on designing research. Chapter eight is on lit review. And she, she lays out four broad categories of lit review, general lit review, critical lit review, what she calls systematic review, and then supportive search. What you presented today seems to me like it fits like within her third type, what she calls systematic review. Are, are you familiar with her typology? And how, how does it how does that match up? Okay, so as will not surprise you, like when, when, when we first started this, we actually had a, that table with the different types of reviews. It was based on a different piece of work, which talked about other types of reviews. When, Anne's book was 2008, right? Uh, yeah, it's been a while, yeah. Okay, so, you know, and, and, the, and the systematic review, a la Tran, Tranfield and Denier and the rest of those guys kind of came up uh, um, later, a couple years later, right? So there's a bunch of different people who have different names for things. Um, and I'm agnostic, right? And like, like all things in our field, I wish we could get some coherence and consistency. But absent that, all I want you to think about is that there is a value to saying, to recognizing that people from different, have from different sort of traditions are examining things and they work, inter they have an internal logic and internal sense and internal set of findings. And it's really important to sort of take those things and look across them. Those are the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want to call it, I don't care. Uh, what is the book I referenced? Uh, Mark. <laughs> that's funny. Um, hey, that's cool. I actually usually, get, when people mistake my name, it's usually Mark. So uh, <laughs> that's funny. It's the first time in the reverse. Um, yeah. And Huff's, the, 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 by the way, that Huff I think is the first in my uh, it's that that first circle I showed you that's hers right so that's I've got to think I get that reference in my in my in my paper too um, so how would we justify and use snowballing versus boolean searches uh, good question the bigger question I think is what is the right way to search um I think the, the again the challenge the usual way people search what you what you don't want to do is you know sort of say I only looked in these journals that's bad right but if you if you wanted to again it sort of depends on the constructs right so if you have something that is very well um, like going back to selection selection is a very well established term right you should use selection to study selection, right? And there probably aren't going to be a ton of different variations of that. However, if you were going to talk about the experience of negative emotions in relation to psychological strain, what we were calling psychological pain, but nobody liked, um, that, that I'm not sure. There you sort of need to use different kinds of searches, right? Like, um, because there isn't a clear singular definition so whether it's boolean or snowballing is really just that sort of secondary to like what is the nature of the construct you are studying and how much coherence and consistency is there in the communities or in the research communities that you're going to look to again economists use things differently you know it, it, it's always about like sort of drawing a boundary where you're not what you don't want is for somebody to say oh that behavior that you're talking about, there's a whole lot of people who study it. Like, for instance, I did, um, my dissertation was on respect, right? Did a lot of work to define it and all this other stuff. And I mean, many years later, I, I was talking about the Wiesenfeld and she says, well, that sounds a lot like status, right? And I was like, oh, geez, that does sound a lot like status, doesn't it, right? And Steve later, later on said, oh, they're kind of the same. You know, um, I don't think they are, but uh, but actually his his saying they're the same made it helpful. But anyway, this is, again, what are we studying? How have people studied it? That's always the basic question. How important is replicability? Well, you know, you've got a lot of good questions here, Samit. I like these. Um, so I assume you mean if I gave another person the same criteria, would they come up with the same articles and would they come up with the same beliefs coming up with the same articles is important so it's why we try and make it as systematic as possible right um it's, it's sort of you can check the logic like but in terms of drawing the same conclusions mm, no 
You know, there's some work uh, by a colleague of mine, Amy Sommer, who who was, you know, sort of showed with the very same data, you got very different um, sort of like uh, uh, parameters, same data set, when she gave it to different labs across the country. That's not a, you, you know, that's because people always, in any analysis, you have to make judgment calls, right? It's, that's the way it works, right? Everything that is as advanced as what we're doing has that. So as long as it's not like wildly off the mark, I think you're good, right? And as long as you can sort of defend your, I mean, again, you know this, we, we two, two researchers can look at the very same finding and interpret it very differently, right? Depending on the assumptions they are making. So as long as it's defensible, I think we're good. Is there a disadvantage in pursuing integrated review on specific fields of research, such as circular economy, platform economy, food loss, and waste? Hmm. The very fact that they're restricted to circles means that there's need to make the field open to different interpretations, but AMA seems more inclined towards concept related to organizing and management or strategic management. Funny you should ask. So we've had a bunch this time that were on these sorts of things, um, kind of specific and, and often sustainability related. Honestly, one of the challenges I think with our field is that we should have we should have like a large bodies of work on narrow things. One of my favorite topics here is meetings. So Joe Allen does a lot of work on meetings and with Nala Lim and Willenbrock, right? Meetings are important. We have them a lot, right? There's ways to understand them. It's and I think it would be wonderful to have a huge body of research where we could have an integrated review on that. We just don't have it yet. So is there enough stuff on circular economy? It would be great if there was, and you could write a review, an integrated review on circular economy that attached it to the other things that were being studied in our field. That is what I mean about lumping, right? Most of the things we study in our field are related to other things in our field. And you know, we there are no silver bullet solutions for these kinds of problems. They're rather systems and, and aggregations. So um that's what we should be doing. But in, to, your, to your pragmatic question is like, could you do it now? Well, not yet, often, right? It's That's a challenge and that's gonna be an ongoing one. All right. Um, so yeah, oh, Steve, I should, yeah, Steve is, was Joe's advisor. I was, uh, um, so thank you for, for, for mentioning that. Um, so, uh, and I love that work. So um, how do you judge proposals that authors are using direct versus circumstantial evidence? Um, can they point to it in the in the papers that they're reviewing? Can they say this review, this paper found this finding, right? That's It's just that simple. If they can't, circumstantial, right? Um, so um, in Annals AE at AOM, said that one can't review more than 115 articles and yet you may who okay uh i understand that one needs to review the entire corpus to do the job but i'm concerned that approval will get rejected if the number of articles seems too few yep it will and or too ambitious yep it will um or if other aes have a different number in mind any insider advice okay yes the i've been an ae this i was an AE for three terms before i was editor and there was variation right the fact is one of the reasons I wanted to become editor is because uh, annals I had seen when Laura and Sim took it over and I first went on, um, we've been evolving, right? And one of the things that's been evolving is how many studies, right? When I remember way before 2019, sitting with Don and Kim and saying 40 studies is enough, but we've, ev we've evolved, right? So 115, no, lower limit, right? We've, that's almost for sure gonna get you rejected these days. To be, again, we are trying to, we don't just like, you don't throw a proposal in, we say, oh, we've changed our minds, you didn't know that, so we're rejecting it. We'd go back and we'd say, hey, listen, you know, we need more now, what can you do to expand this? Um, but, and we're going to, we're going to be working on updating the website soon to sort of like reflect these new changes. Um, but uh, the, uh, you know, but it's a work in progress, right? And again, I think one of the reasons I keep doing these things is to hear these comments from people and to sort of take these things into consideration because collectively, like we're all doing science. Like, like this has to make sense. We all have to sort of be part of this conversation. And so that's that's the point here. Um, 
Could I talk more about how to synthesize? Examples of how to do it good versus bad. You know, Joanne, I was thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> My preferred method is a model, right? A, a, a picture really does force you to focus on what is what is important. And it's funny because when people make models, often they sort of come up with like, you know, in this box, here's the 50 things, in this box, here's the 20 things, in this box, here's the 10 things, and here's the 15 arrows, right? And when you look at that, you go, hmm, that's not good, right? A simple, clear picture on focusing you on what what should I get by looking at this? I feel like that is a really, really good general approach. Again, the nature of the synthesis may change, right? Uh, sometimes people are look again, like I'm I'm not kidding. Nine thousand nine hundred studies is a lot, right? Um, that that's that, and that was synthesized using bibliometric uh, models, which, by the way, I still don't exactly get. Um, but um, there's also, um, you know, sort of like process models. I think, you know, there, there is no one way to do it. But again, if you have, if you've done the review and you have all the themes from the communities, you say, here are the communities and here are the important things that each one says uniquely, and here's what they all agree on. That's a great starting point, right? It's just, you know, and it and it's not unlike, you know, again, there's many analogs. Think about when you're looking, running models of data, right? How many, you know, like you, how you, how many models actually make it into the paper versus the ones that you ran? Fifteen percent, maybe, right? Like so, so, so it's see it as a process of distillation, refocusing, distillation, refocusing. And again, the lucky thing is that that's one of the nice. Again, I, I what I like about our process is that you know you work with another person who is trying to see it from the reader's perspective. And it, we often go back and forth on how to sort of co-create those models. But it's tough, you know, it's a, it's a good it's a good question. If you keep it in mind, I think it helps. Matthew. Um, yeah, yeah, right, you, what's I think up? we, time-wise, we're getting close to the um, mm. 90 minutes slot. So unless there are any other questions, um, which we can start answer, answer at least one question, I think, but unless yeah. there's any other ones, we can bring it to a close. Okay, final question, anyone got one? Going once, going twice. I have one question. Ah, Carolina, right in the... Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> last second. Um, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about the potential you see in a proposal that still needs, because you did mention that often most proposals need to go back for review before you accept them. What is kind of acceptable yeah. to re review actually... and where is you dead set? So let me, so, so one of my, uh, um, Stefan, I think it was Stefan or um, maybe it was Percy. One of my, he's had this great thing where they said, a third of people really do think about how we should change our thinking on a topic. And they put that in the proposal. A third of people, it's kind of there and you can kind of see it. And a third of people, it never even occurs to them that that's what we should do. That third, they're out of there, right? Here's how we should change how we study this topic, and here is why. If that is clear, that is your best shot, right? And specifically. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome.